Well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, it's going to be an exciting day today. Shmuel has some, um, it's been an eventful. I think everybody has seen the headlines, and uh, what a weekend. Not a good one. Um, so, Shmuel, give us some updates. Tell us what's going on there. Right. Thank you, Kim. Um, the situation, it's, it's always not normal, but I want to show you this. And look where I'm right now, okay? I'm going to move my computer. Okay, I'm sitting in an ice cream, ice cream shop in the city of Modin. And I came here for an event and I said, I need to go. I have a Zoom and I'm going to go back there. <clears throat> and why I show you this is I see people in the end of the summer, eating ice cream. And yet, two days ago, September 1st, was probably the hardest day since October 7th. If you've been to Israel on Sunday, you would literally feel down, and you will feel sad, and you will feel people walking like zombies. It was a mix. It was the day of the start of the year, was the school year started. And people were like thrilled to send their kids um, to school. And yet on Saturday night already, we found out and we heard there were situation when they found six hostages. And unfortunately in the morning, we revealed the stories and the faces Suddenly, everything stopped. You know, the one person, probably the famous, the most famous uh, kidnapped hostage, um, Hirsch, and his face was so familiar to so many places. It felt like literally the country stopped. In his funeral at five o'clock in the afternoon, people tuned in to watch it live from all over Israel, from all over the world. It was a place of, I can tell you, the feeling was loss of hope. When we heard that they were literally got shot a couple of days, maybe a couple of days, hours before they were found, the feeling was this notion of we cannot lose this situation. Those hostages won't be released alive. They will survive more than 300 days in the tunnels. We heard that their physical situation was really bad. They were thin. They lost weight. Awful time. And yet in the last minute, a bullet in the head. The feeling was we were incapable to stand from it. And I texted my wife. I told her, listen, I'm in work. I came back after a long summer trip and I'm sitting in front of my desk and I cannot work. Like I felt on the 8th of October and the 9th, people were all tuning in into it. And I thought it was only me. But that was the feeling and that was the notion all around Israel. That morning, to raise the bar of sadness, there were three police officers that were murdered on the main road next to Hebron, next to Hebron. One of them lost his daughter on the 7th of October. I cannot explain the heavy heart we had and we have. And since that moment, something snapped. Because if you saw the news from that moment, in the afternoon of Sunday, demonstrations all over Israel. People are walking to the streets and yelling to the prime minister, stop the madness. Do something. Release the hostages. Make a deal. Do something to stop it. And on the flip side, Netanyahu yesterday stands in front of Israel and shows a note that was found in one of the tunnels written by Sinwal himself, the head terrorist of the Hamas, saying 
that's exactly the point. I want to bring the people of Israel into this fight. Blame Netanyahu for this, not the Hamas who murdered Netanyahu, to make this commotion inside of Israel and break us from inside. And this three days, until this moment, that's what we have in our head. I have friends calling me, literally from all over the world, including an offer from one of my friends who lives in Athens, tells me, Israel is falling down. Come live in Athens with us. Don't be the last person standing in Israel. I want to stop this thought for a second, and I want to jump into the main headlines of today's newspaper. The IDF announced Judea and Samaria is an official new combat zone. Did you see the last attempt for terror in Judea and Samaria in the last couple of days? Three cars that were supposed to explode inside communities. Two in Gush Etzion, one in Benjamin, a car with it is 40 or 400 kilos of explosives ready to be exploding immediately when the bus of the school kids is going to leave the community. Thank God in those three situations, nothing happened. You can see the video of one of them being um, like exploded in a gas station in Bush Etzion. Our guest today lives, what, Gabi, three minutes from that station? Yeah, uh, four or five minutes. Yeah, but yeah. Hi, hi, everyone. The official announcement by the Israel IDF tells you that there's a new reality that we talked about many times over and over again. That the situation in Judea and Samaria is a situation that needs to be covered as well. We were focusing in the last year almost in the north and in the south, and we allowed to open a new terror nest inside Judea and Samaria. I don't want to shout. People are around. But if we will understand the amount of ammunition that was you know, drawn into Judea and Samaria, the amount of tunnels, equipment that was brought from Iran, they caught equipment from Iran in Judea and Samaria. And this is exactly where we live. Like I am now in Modin. This is not Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria is seven minutes from here. The understanding now that the government has and the IDF has is if we will not enter or re-enter and visit all the major Arab towns and stop the terror development there, we will have the 7th of October throughout Israel in every area that borders with Samaria. And open the map and you will see all of the major cities are bordering with Judea and Samaria. And in the last years, just like what happened on the 7th of October, we fell asleep and they allow themselves to develop get more ammunition geared up, have tunnels, and all the equipment needed for an operation, a serious operation that will happen in the region. Right now, in the last couple of weeks, the main attempts are in Jenin and in Tulkarem. You probably hear about it, arrest here, arrest there. There was a guy who actually, a soldier who died a couple of days ago in one of those operations, but it's only the beginning. And it's official as formed yesterday, that the next big move is going to be in Judea and Samaria, in the big Arab villages. I have I have Gabi Krause today as our guest, and before I'm going to give him the opportunity to share with us, I would say this, it's all about timing. What happened in the last week in Israel is equivalent to what happened in the last four months before that. Like it's everything comes into this boiling moment right now. 
the demonstrations, the devastating news from the hostages. Netanyahu is in a very difficult situation with the government inside and outside. The terror opportunities in Judea and Samaria, the election in the U.S., and the pressure that comes from all different directions to seize a deal right now. And that's exactly where we're standing at. Do we give away the opportunity to control the border and the area between Egypt and Gaza and allowing everything that happened until now to re-happen because they're going to be under control in Gaza and they would be able to have a clean line of ammunition entering from Sinai Peninsula? Or we stop right now. Yesterday, Netanyahu stood and said it in the most simple way you can imagine. Sinwal, it ain't going to happen. We will not allow our forces to leave the Philadelphia border, which is the border area between Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula. I'm giving all these updates, but you will hear much more from that from all the outlets and in the end of this talk hopefully Kim is going to share also our new telegram account where I'm starting this new initiative to bring updates live updates from Israel on our telegram and I hope you will join as well I'm stopping right now and I'm going to give the respect and honor to my friend Gabi Kraus Gabi is leading one of the most original initiatives I think we have in our region and actually throughout Israel. It's a it's 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 an initiative that connects exactly to topics we talked about in this very meeting in the past with ultra orthodox and how can they integrate into the army. So without anything else, Gabi, Shalom, how are you? I wanna say first, Gabi, tell us just a minute or two about yourself. And then we're going to start with the video, please. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you so much Shmuel, for the opportunity. And thank you everyone for coming and giving me the honor to uh, present myself and what we do. Uh, by the way, Shmuel, you know that uh, just uh, what you said before, the car that exploded in Gush Etzion, I, I live in Efrat. I live in Efrat in Gush, uh, Gush Etzion, married to Vardit. I have four kids. Um, the car that was supposed that exploded in uh, in the gas station in Gush Etzion was aimed to come into a frat uh, next to where I live, but then uh, the Arab I saw the video. The Arab sees uh, the security car, so he made the U turn and went to the the gas station, and then eventually exploded over there. But it was, it was supposed to explode in a frat. That was the that was his goal. So uh, so yeah, thank you for the uh, for sharing also that story, uh, Shmuel. Um, yeah, so again, like Shmuel said, I work with, I uh, have the honor of, uh, for three years to work with an organization that uh, named Osei Chayil, uh, that the mission is to really accept uh, soldiers, men and women, lone soldiers, uh, lone Israeli soldiers that uh, come from uh, ultra-Orthodox backgrounds that, they, as you probably know, the ultra-Orthodox uh, families uh, believe in learning Torah and uh, uh, the, uh, these uh, young people also want to serve in addition to learning Torah, also want to serve in the army. And that's why it's difficult to, for them to come back home in the weekends when they, uh, when they go out of the army. So what we do, and I'll give I'll elaborate more after the video, what we do is really provide these soldiers that uh, also face economical and emotional challenges. We provide them a home and a family, but I'll tell you more after the video, if that's okay with you. Right. I just want to say before yeah. the video, this topic is quite a sophisticated one. It touches many levels in the Israeli society, and we will try to explain everything. So let's yeah. bring the video first. Thanks. Hi, my name is Yaakov Nissenbaum, 25 years old. My name is Shoshana. My name is Avi Friedman, and today I would be happy to share with you my story. I grew up in a ultra Haredi house, Hasidic. At the age of 19, I decided to draft into the IDF. I was born and raised in Yerushalayim to a Haredi family. At the age of 17, I decided to take a different way. And my parents didn't accept that. So I find myself on the street in a really tough place, dark place, in survival mode. 
הגעתי לעמותה חצי שנה לפני שהתגייסתי, בזמן שלא היה לי איפה לגור, איפה לישון. Due to my family's state, um, I didn't really have a lot of support from my family, if it's money-wise, if it's just in general going into the army, also as a woman, because they're very orthodox and in general. The Osichail organization gave me an apartment, a place that I can call my house. They provide me food, they provide me education, and they provide me the help, and the psychological help, and, and the basic help, and more and more, so I can serve in the army. I was able to find great comfort in the OC Hyatt organizations. I joined uh, one of their apartments. Uh, what makes it really unique and made the life good as a soldier is whenever you come back, there's always not only an apartment waiting for you, but also someone to give you a good hug, a good word, just like any other family would give or support their soldiers. <laughs> המשפחה הזאת נותנת את הלב שלה, פותחת את הבית שלה, מלווה אותה בטקסים, וגם כל שבת שהם מגיעים, הם באים לארוחה, לחברה, לשיחה, הם שם בשבילהם, כי בעצם אין להם כלום. אני עוד תרפיסט של אוסי חייל, ופרסונלי תריט את הסולג'רס. אנחנו רוצים להגיד לסולג'רס מנטל סטביליטי להתמודד את הצלחות של אדולט חיים בישראל. אני מקומם אותם בפריאד לפני שהם יגיעו לארמי, until they study at the academy. Today I am in the army, in the army, in the army, and although I am in the army, I have a job, I have a family in the army that has helped me and helped me, and the army has helped me with everything I need, if it's a house, a house, a house, a house. For some people it's such a simple thing, the house, the food, and, and the, the help around it, but for us it's Mamesh Atzalos Nefoshes. And uh, thank you very much to the Osi Chayel organization. Finally, I have a place of my own where I can put my stuff in and I can sleep without having to wonder what's going to happen next. I appreciate it so much. Okay. Um, I, we have many questions, okay? I will have many questions on the video I just saw. I want you to remember the majority of the people here know about service in the army, know okay. what's an ultra-Orthodox Jew is, and we want to try to connect the dots and explain what is the actual situation and how is Judea and Samaria becomes a centerpiece in this story. Because okay. from my, in my perspective, This is an example of how the people of Judea and Samaria are giving back to the Israeli society from their power. So I want to start mm -hmm. with the first question. Tell us who was the person, the older person who talked there in the end. I think people need to understand. Wow. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll answer your question first. So the older person who spoke in the end is Tzvi Kamor. He's uh, our emotional, uh, we have a few emotional therapists. He heads... The, uh, the emotional therapy program for our soldiers, um, you know, because they face many challenges, emotional challenges where they have to go to the army and uh, live uh, apart from their families. Um, Tzvika Moore, actually, just uh, his son is also a hostage now in Gaza. He was kidnapped. Uh, uh, he's in, yeah, that, that, that video was actually taken before October 7th. Uh, Tzvi Kamor is an amazing individual. Uh, he's also an adoptive family in Kiryat. He lives in Kiryat Arba, uh, Hebron, actually uh, really on the border. A great person. Yeah, his son Eitan Moore is kidnapped. Hope we're hoping for him to, uh, we're praying for him to come back every day alive. And uh, he was kidnapped together with the uh, former mayor of Hebron, Kiryat Arba, Hebron, uh, Liebman. Uh, Liebman's son, unfortunately, was found uh, dead. And Eitan Moore, we, we're still praying for his, uh, for his return. So he's uh, the head of emotional therapies. He actually is one of the greatest individuals I know in person as well. He even came twice uh, when our soldiers from Osei Chayil, you know, some of them serve in Gaza and also in Judea and Samaria. I, I don't, we, we don't have any soldiers up north, but we have in Judea and Samaria, we have also in, in Gaza. And when they come out, he comes in, uh, even now he comes and talks with them to give them support, emotional support and strength. Um, so he still continues. Yeah, he's a great individual. Um, Just to, that, that, to, yeah. to emphasize the point, yeah. although he's struggling with his own personal situation with a kidnapped son, he's still there 
helping and supporting others. What a great individual. And I must say, he's a very became very famous and well-known because the way he speaks, he shows so much heroism. And, 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 and he always talks about how the nation's uh, best is before his own son. He always right. talks about, like, I, I love my son, I care about my son, but what does the nation need right now? Do we really need to release everybody? Do we need to give up everything? Okay, let's put it aside. Gabi, let's... let's I, by the way, I, 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 another note, by the way, on the video, I don't know if you probably, probably saw, there was, uh, unfortunately, in Osecha, we had two soldiers also got killed in, uh, in the battle on October 7th. One of them is also uh, David Mittelman from our Rostrum apartment. But just uh, that's something personal I wanted just to share as well. Um, so I'll give you some, if that's okay with you, I'll just give you some, uh, I'll go from the beginning how Osei Chai was formed. Sure. So Osei Chai was formed by uh, Rabbi Aaron Granot, uh, a, a, res a resident of Kirat Arba Hebron. Um, in 2016, he heard of uh, a soldier needed a place to stay because he drafted into the army, and he just uh, got him, brought him to his house. And uh, slowly, slowly, more and uh, more and more uh, soldiers from Korean backgrounds heard about Aaron Granot and asked him also to come live in Kirat Arba. So uh, Aaron Granot decided to rent apartments in Kirat Arba. Today we have 12 apartments in Kirat Arba, which have our, our home for lone soldiers. What we do is um, we we uh, attach every apartment has an adaptive family living nearby, um, that which, which which is really an anchor of support. You know, the soldiers come home, they know that they, they don't only have a, have a roof on top of their head and food to eat and also clothing to wear, but they also have an adaptive family that is waiting for them, will come to the ceremonies and really... Uh, become a family to them with the siblings and the parents and they know they have not only a roof over their head but also a, a, an emotional anchor and support for, for them with a the family so, so, um, I, I, yeah. I think we need to emphasize one thing yeah. mm -hmm. what is the challenge of coming from an ultra orthodox family right. though the notion we know that they don't want to go to the army we know that they're against going to the army what happens to an individual who goes to the army anyway. A person right. comes to his parents, his rabbis, and says to them, I want to go to the army. What happens to him? Right. So uh, as you probably know, the ultra-Orthodox uh, community in general, you know, you, as uh, you probably know, that there's all kinds of, uh, there's Hasidic uh, Haredi, ultra-Orthodox, there's uh, Litai, there's, all, there's a wide range of Haredi uh, types of, uh, of families. But uh, in general, they're all uh, they're not they're not positive and not uh, in favor of going to the army because they believe more in only learning Torah. Uh, by us uh, now, just to answer your question, what uh, what happens is you know they face uh, when a young person goes and tells the rabbi, the family, mommy and daddy, I want to go in addition to learning Torah, I also want to go serve the, our nation, our army. The the family is very scared, and also the rabbis are very scared that okay, you're gonna go to the army, you may lose your uh, the time of learning Torah, maybe lose your faith. That that's the biggest fear, and this is why the uh, mainly the ultra orthodox community is against. Uh, you know, they believe that uh, um, how, how would I say it? Uh, the over um, the scenery of the army it doesn't match what an ultra orthodox young man or woman have to see. They have to be in the yeshiva. Now Torah, now let's. Again. Let's yeah. let's be honest, Gabi. Both of us yeah. went to the army. Right. The yeah. army is not an easy place for a religious person. For sure. There's a lot of tension. It's a new culture. We need to imagine people that never never know anybody outside of their small close Bubble. community. Yeah. Now they're exposed. It's mm -hmm. a big step. It's a big move. And for many, it becomes this frightening situation. Now, yeah. is this frightening situation needs to be something that you shouldn't go. You know, we disagree. We went, although we were different from the vast majority. But in this community, it's like it's the end of the world, maybe for them. And they don't want to bring more people in. So I assume that what happens in a very uh, close situation is that they're telling their kids, their loved ones, okay, you want to go to the army? Don't come back to the neighborhood. I don't yeah. want everybody to look at us. I don't want everybody to be part of it. I don't want your brothers to be influenced. Exactly. I don't want people yeah. to have this thing that they might go to the army. So so what do they do? Who can they approach in this situation when they're not welcome back at their families? So, yeah. So this, uh, I agree with every word you said. This is exactly the problem. And this is why... 
uh, at Osei Chai, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, elaborate a little more. Today, we have 22 apartments that we rent across Israel. The majority of them, we have, uh, I think we have 14 apartments are in Judea and Samaria. We have in Kirat Arab Hebron, we have in Elin, we have in Gush Etzion, and in Susia. Yeah, and we have like uh, over 50 soldiers uh, residing, living in these apartments. Um, and also the other places are also like in, uh, in religious communities. The reason uh, our uh, our apartments are a good thing, just like Shua, uh, Shmuel said, you know, uh, the fear is, uh, okay, you're going to go to the army, you're going to be in like in a secular community. By us, uh, our uh, the lone soldiers find, find a very good solution. And why is that? And I don't want to boast about our uh, the, the settlers about and Jan Samaria, but you know they, many of them are very warm families and welcoming, uh, and also they keep the Torah, the Bible, they go out, they keep the amendments, and this is why for these lone soldiers who come from these backgrounds, it's a very I would say a soft landing. Okay, by us we believe both in uh, Zionism and uh, keeping the Torah, the Bible, all the amendments. And this is why when these lone soldiers come from these backgrounds, they find like a soft landing by us because they have families and know what they go through. They, they know their backgrounds. And by us, they can still keep it and still uh, uh, live their, their former lifestyle and still serve in the army and have like, uh, you know, like uh, also an anchor support and also uh, uh, have a similar life to where they come from. So, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is, and just, and to, and to yeah. be honest, and to be honest, you know, we saw it during this war. Okay, we'll give an example. I showed it already, this video here. There was, uh, um, there was a soldier who died. His wife gave this emotional speak. His name is uh, Elisha. Um, what was the last name? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Levenstern. Okay. Uh, right. Elisha yeah. Levenstern. His wife... Right give this emotional talk and she gives examples of how he was this guy listen to this guppy he was training first the very famous photo of him sitting in gaza inside of an arab house learning torah inside gaza and and she always shares about the fact that you know when he was training he had this app of like push-ups or like pullovers and then 60 seconds break between sets it would open a book to give you the, the 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 notion of we know of so many people that can integrate being a soldier being in the army and be a very religious person continue to learn continue to pray to be a, a man of god so this is not here, that's exactly what she says, straight in the Torah, that Margot just said that, correct. So you have this living examples all over Judea and Samaria in their families. And now the ultra-Orthodox kid come to a family and they see, that's what we do. We serve in the army and yet we serve God. We learn, we pray, and we are mixing this into our life. So, so you provide them a place to live, you provide them groceries, you provide them the necessities of their life, and you're helping in that way. I want to ask, how are the people of the communities integrated in the story? Because you have like 15 guys coming to your community. How does it work? So for me, that's the most beautiful part of the organization. Because I'll tell you why, to rent an apartment and bring soldiers, that's a very easy part. By us, you know, say hi, the main the main project, you know, it's also the the, uh, the most cost effective because it's free. We have volunteers. Is the adoptive families today? We have forty one adoptive families that are uh, really a family for the soldiers. What happens? We before we open an apartment, we make sure that we have an in Judea and Samir, It's very very easy because we always approach and you know we have the people that are always always say bring them to us, bring them to us. Uh, so what happens, we, before we open an apartment, we make sure we have the community and the families want to support the families when they come home to be like the, the second family to them. Uh, so for me, that's the most beautiful part of Osei Chai, the adoptive families. And in and, uh, and Hebron, in and, uh, and Kiryat Arba, in Eli, in Susia, and also in Rosh, only in Rosh Tzrim itself, in Kibbutz Rosh Tzrim, in Gush Etzion, we have 17 adoptive families that are an ink. It's beautiful. I welcome you to come when you come visit in Israel to visit. Uh, there's uh, David Mittelman, who unfortunately died on October 7th. His family is also an English-speaking family. They speak about 
uh, how, how, how they brought him to the family, how he opened up to them slowly, slowly, and really learned about the fact that, he is, that, that there's many, many religious families in, and, uh, that are able to serve in the army and learn Torah and be a uh, Torah observant. So uh, for me, that's the, so like uh, to answer your question, uh, Shmuel, the, the families are very, very active. And without them, I think the Sechai would, would not be able to exist. We need them. We have them. And I'll tell you even a secret. I live in Efrat. We have Ava and one of their neighbors. That's where I live. Families are begging me to, uh, to tell their, our CEO to open a new apartment in Efrat. <laughs> uh, so hopefully when he gets out of Gaza, he's down in Gaza now, in Itzarim, hopefully we'll think about uh, to open a new apartment in Efrat as well. But uh, yeah. I hope it answers your question. So. I love it. I, I can tell you that, you know, one of the reasons why I brought you this month specifically is to, that tonight is the new month of Elul. And when you hear the new month of Elul, you know immediately the high holidays are coming in exactly one month. I'm thinking when the next Zoom is going to be after Rosh Hashanah, right? After, after the beginning of the day year. And when I think of the beginning of the year and I think of the high holidays, especially this year, and Gabi, you can share from your perspective as well, I can imagine how many people are struggling this year in the high holidays. I'm talking about, forget about the emotions, forget about the people who lost their loved ones. I'm thinking about all the people who just, you know, cannot afford the high holidays coming. How many people lost their jobs? How many people businesses are collapsing? No, we live in a crazy situation. I don't think people get what we're going through. This is a not normal situation in Israel. It's almost a year of a war. And all the things we thought changed. And people are evacuated from their homes. And people are fighting in the army more than 250 days. My friend, Yotab, I mentioned him many times. He's served in the last 10 months, more than 250 days. He told me on the Sabbath that Sunday started two months service in Gaza over again. This is not a normal situation. And, 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 I'm, and I'm saying it, right, you know, as we speak, because I talked to Gabi, it's, it's like it's, it's meant to be. We're talking about how people need help as we speak. As we speak here, I don't know if you can see my phone. I get a text message message from Anat. Kim, you know Anat. Anat is the head social worker of Samaria. She asks me, how can we help families in need this high holidays? And I'm thinking about all the different segments that are struggling. The soldiers, the families, the wives that are without their husbands, the husbands that are without their wives. I want to ask you, what's the follow-up? So you go, you're in the army and you do the service and you live in this apartment. Where do they go next, Gabi? Like, what's their hope in life? Do they have anywhere to go? How is their after life the, changed? After the army? After yeah. the army. What well, do we do after with them? the army, it's, I, you know, before I joined the Seychai, I never thought of it. But, you know, uh, you know by us, uh, after the army, is actually the most difficult time of a lone soldier that uh, comes from uh, ultra. Uh, the lone soldier from Israel, I'll tell you why. And I never thought of it before I started in the organization because what happens is during the army, he has the, he has the adoptive families, he has the seichai, he has uh, the friends in the apartments. You know, they, they all come, they live together. And, and when he leaves the army, that's where he gets the, the slap in his face. Why is that? Because he has no, uh, he doesn't have seichai. And many times they, they don't have a matriculation report. They don't learn to study English. They don't study math. And you go into the uh, into the new life without uh, the support system that they had, without the army, without Sikhai, without nothing. Um, so by us, what we do, we allow the soldiers to reside in the apartments until a few months after they finish the army. We have a program for them to uh, like a pre-academic program, and we have like a, we we try to help them to find the work or some to find to supply them the food and still the clothing until a few months. So they have a softer landing into the, the civil world, uh, into the uh, civilian uh, Israeli life. Um, yes, it's a very it's a very difficult period now. Even today, even especially, but today it's very hard to find jobs in Israel. And uh, so again, we try to do the the best the best we can. That's uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, I'm I, I'm thinking yeah. about way, like going coming out, 
coming out without the network and without your like support from a family and not without the knowledge you need it's a very hard struggle a very hard situation and they have, you have no system like you're by yourself you can do whatever you want i think this is something that that needs to be focused also right uh yeah that's a very yes yeah, I thought there's a question to that one. So again, now we also, yeah. So yeah. if somebody has a question, please, you can ask. But if you, um, by the way, just to give another point, uh, uh, since the war started, uh, can, can you hear me? Oh. Yeah, I said since the war started, we also said, since we got, you know, we have uh, over 200 uh, graduates in Osei Chayil, and uh, I would say maybe between a third to half of them are also now in reserves fighting uh, also in Gaza, and and also, I think, yeah, mostly in Gaza, uh, a third of them. So we had some requests for emotional support. So in addition, again, like I said, our support in Osei Chayil for the current soldiers is very simple, like uh, Shmuel, like you said, we have the the home is an apartment a roof on top of their head we have clothing we have food we have the adaptive families but the, the emotional therapy is also a very important factor our graduates uh, now also we're trying to help them to integrate into the civilian life easier so we have uh driving uh, driving lessons and also uh, emotional therapies because you know many times you know they come they get the slap in their face and we want to help them as much as we can to give them a cushion the land softer uh, that's all. Yeah, sorry, I'm open for questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Gabi, Gabi, thank you so much. And um, I will, yeah. I would, I would love to say that my aim in this conversation and how I want to help, and I think we should help, is you know helping the communities that help Osechail and the houses. Because I'm thinking about the need of you know the volunteering family that comes and help and support they need also to be supported and they yeah. need we need to build this circle you know christian friend of israeli communities support so many initiatives in judea and samaria in communities and i think when the people of judea and samaria continue and do good for others as well and to see that they are devoted to that i think it's a real like circle of blessing that continues and we need to connect to that so help people to do good and that's right. amazing. So, I'm Gabi, thank ready. you so much. And and sure. I will share in the next email more about your organization as well and the links and everything about this place. Thank you so much. Amazing. I want to finish and wrap up our things. We don't have a lot of time. And they say okay. three things before we finish. Number one, I just saw on the um, chat, you can see uh, our new Telegram channel. Please go and follow us on Telegram. It's like there's not going to be a chat there. We will post a, a couple of times during the week and updates from the land. And I think it's a great new way to connect, easy and simple. So please, you can see it on the chat. Number two, I see um, Kim. She also uh, she puts a link here for Sukkot food. This is ways to help in food vouchers to people in Samaria for the high holidays. Listen, I need to say that, you know, we are helping in so many ways in Judea and Samaria. But there's one time I hear that I really, my heart almost explodes. And this is when I go and I travel to Rami Levi. Rami Levi is a very big supermarket chain in Israel. And I buy vouchers. I buy 400, 500 vouchers of 400 shekels or so. And I know, like, and they're driving next to me on the car. I put it on the next seat next to me. It's cost a lot of money, right? A lot of donations I need. But I can think of how much joy am I picking now in my hands. Like, it's really making their, their, their holiday tables different. And I know that if we won't be there to help them, they won't have it. Now, to tell you they will starve, it's not true. They won't starve. But the difference between having this and not having this is, is life-changing. And I see the happiness and I see the appreciation and I see the, the love 
that 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 CFOAC gets from it, and it's crazy. And during the summer, I I think I wrote about it. And I had somebody calling me from one of the communities. He got my personal number, and he said to me, "I know that in two months or so we're gonna get free vouchers, but I need your help today." I said, "What happened? Like what? You know, where are you coming from?" And he told me the story. I am not going to share a personal story, a devastating story, okay? Now, usually we don't do that. We don't help individuals, random. We go through the communities because, you know, we need to have some a mechanism to know exactly who needs to be covered and how we do it properly. So I reached out to the social worker of Samaria, and I told her, check about this guy. Like, what's the story? And she came back to me and says, listen, it's a serious situation. So I already signed him like into three different places that for food vouchers and we helped them on the spot, whatever we could. And me personally also, I also uh, um, helped them because there's a real need and it breaks my heart to imagine that people need help to support their their table and their holidays. So I think it's, it's a necessary cause. And once a year, we're doing it. I think twice a year. I holidays and Passover. These are the two times we dedicate time to help the communities. And the last thing I want to tell you about how crazy Israel is right now. So I've spent the summer touring in the U.S. I've been to many places. I gave many lectures. I had some downtime with my family as well. I've landed Friday two hours before the Sabbath. Not two hours, four hours before the Sabbath. After I was stuck in Cyprus, with canceled flights. I'm not going to get to the whole story. It's just, you know, st flights were canceled. United, I took. I was stuck. Anyway, I landed in Israel on a Friday, okay? We spent the Sabbath there. And, and you know, takes time after two months. I still wake up in the morning and I'm like, where am I? I'm in Israel. I'm in the U.S. Like, what's happening around me? So Sunday afternoon, I get the realization I'm in Israel. So you're in Israel, you're in Samaria, you're with your family. What's the first thing you do that you realize you are there indeed? I'm going to show you. Did you saw what I went to? And I, and I went to the local commander who kept my weapon away. And I just was reunited with my personal weapon. It's a full rifle. It's not a gun. It's an actual rifle. And this is to show you what happens in Judea and Samaria as we speak. This is the reality. And if it wasn't sure enough, the army announcement about being a combat zone in Samaria, the three attempts during the weekend and the terror attack that killed three people in Hebron is there to remind us where we live and what's the story in our life right now? And as we speak, and I will always finish this chat like this, we have soldiers fighting for our nation in the north, in the south, in Judea and Samaria. We need never to forget them, to pray for them, and hope for all of them to come back home. And with that, to continue and pray and hope for the fast comeback of our hostages and our kidnapped heroes that for what we've learned this week, they're still alive. And I hope there will be the ways to bring them back home because we need them back home. We cannot stand it anymore. We need a miracle. If it's not clear yet, that's what we need. We need to God to intervene and do his miracles to save this situation. Our hearts are broken. We are in shock. And in awe with the fact that tonight, tonight, as we speak, we are 11 months from the Hebrew date of the attack. My friends, as we speak, my friend who lost his daughter has his memorial service as we speak. Can you imagine it's been 11 months? The feeling we have it's, it was yesterday. 
We're still, our hearts are broken. We're still inside this circle of events and we're still focused and praying and hoping and doing our best to make our life here better. And I want to thank all of you for continuing to reach out, to bless us, to stand with us, to pray for us, and to be part of this. We really do appreciate it. And you should know that you're making a real change in the land, in God's land. And join me in continuing to pray and to bless Israel. Thank you. From the roller coaster of emotions, it's insane, but that's our life. Any question, any thoughts? Gabi is here. I'm here. Kim is here. Please. I just had a quick couple of questions, Shmuel. I just want to clarify. So all of the apartments that Osehail does are only in Judea and Samaria? No, uh, uh, should I answer? Yeah. No, the uh, no most most of the apartments are in Judea and Samaria. We have a, a few more that, that are, are outside. Okay. Have, okay. But uh, I said we have uh, I think four yeah fourteen apartments we have in Judea and Samaria. That's fantastic. And then yeah, the majority, and the the families, the adoptive families, are there in the in the yeah yeah. yeah. So, uh, the we area. have uh, twelve apartments in Kiryat Arba Hebron, an apartment in Rosh Hashanah that houses twelve soldiers. Okay. Minus one died in in, in, uh, in, Kis in Kisufim, yeah, on October 7th, David Mittelman. Uh, in Eli, it's in, the, in Samaria, Binyamin, uh, there's always uh, an argument, where is Eli exactly? In uh, either Binyamin or Samaria. And in Susia, which is not far from Kiryat Arba as well. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, so like, yeah, over 50 soldiers. Wow, that's fantastic. That's it's a you know, here in Colorado Springs, we have the Air Force Academy, and cadets come for four years while they're in school. And we're a sponsor family to a couple of cadets, um, oh, each man. year. So I, I can relate to you know, uh, having adopted soldiers, <laughs> not quite, not quite the same thing, but but sort of. Of course, just so you know, Yaakov, uh, the, the video, the first guy who speaks, Yaakov. He is a graduate, and he's in America. He learned to become a pilot. After wow. So he lives today in America. I think he lives now in Sacramento. Okay. So, uh, we helped him. Uh, actually, I want to tell you another thing. One of our main volunteers he was the head of the Air Force, Eliezer, Shk Eliezer Shkedi. He's a general. He, he commanded the Air Force, and he's a volunteer by us in Osei Chayil. He accepted when we have uh, the young people before the Army, so they come to us like up to six months before the army. They come and uh, the General Shkedi, uh, he goes, meets with them and uh, speaks to them and goes for a trip with them, tells them about the Israeli history, about the army, how what's gonna what they're gonna face, gives them like a motivation talk. And to see like a very high ranked officer that gives them like a lot of inspiration. So he's one of our volunteers from the Air Force. Yeah. That's Just, uh, an anecdote, yeah. <laughs> And then, yeah. um, what is? Can you give us the translation for Ose Hail? What does it mean? Wow, Ose Hail, Ose, Ose is like Ose doing, and Hail is doing. Um, uh, how do you? Uh, valor, valor, that, yeah, valor, yeah, yeah exactly, okay. doing valor. So it's like a, it's like a Jewish uh, phrase. It's, no, but uh, it's also, it's also, a, it's also a, a play of words because Hail exactly. Valor also yeah. sounds like uh, army. Or like uh, a soldier. So yeah, it's like exactly. valor and chayal. It sounds almost the same. So it's like a play of words. Exactly. I love Good it. Question. I love it. Good question. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think everything is clear. Everything is great. Okay, Thank you, my friends, for coming. Wish you all a good night. And if I'm not going to see you before, a happy Jewish New Year. It's exactly a month from now. So this month of a lot of prayer, a lot of, you know, preparing ourselves in repentance of, of, of connecting to the high holidays. This year, four, four straight days, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and the sab Sabbath. So we have a long, long holiday. You know that, Gabi? Prepare. Start to cook. Yeah.
<laughs> yeah, well, listen, I'm I'm very uh, I'm I'm speechless. I've seen all so many people and joining us and learning about. Uh, thank you so much for all the support and for everything. It's really speechless. I don't know what to say. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity uh, for the opportunity and for everything you do. Definitely, thank you, Gabby, for what you do and for sharing with us. We appreciate thank it so tremendously. Much. Thank you, my thank friends. You so Have a Bye. good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.